I'd like to welcome everybody to today's presentation on cognitive behavioral therapy interventions. We're specifically going to be talking about different ways we can use group activities to teach and help clients rehearse cognitive behavioral interventions. I am your host, Dr. Donnelly Snipes. We are going to explore ways to teach CBT interventions in group, and I'd really love to hear from you guys some of your techniques that you use in your practice as well, because obviously uh, you probably have tools that I'm not even familiar with. So let's review real quickly. Why are we teaching this? We want to help people change their thoughts because that has a direct impact on their physiological responses. Remember when we're having stressful thoughts, when we are feeling anxious, when we're telling ourselves there's a threat, that activates our HPA axis or our threat response system and kind of kicks us into overdrive, into fight or flee, which results in a whole cascade of things, including dumping blood sugar, reducing serotonin, increasing norepinephrine and glutamate. A lot of different uh, neurotransmitters are involved in addition to sex hormones and thyroid hormones in the HPA axis process. So if we are able to alter our cognitions and tell ourselves positive things, we are also able to alter our neurotransmitter balances a little bit. Now, this is not the be all end all. It's not the replacement for medication for those people who need it, but it is a technique that can help people on the daily and it can help everybody. Changing behaviors has a direct response on our thoughts and our emotional reactions. If we are doing things that are healthy, we are going outside and getting sunshine. We are choosing to meditate, choosing to be mindful. All of those behaviors can have a direct response on our thoughts. They actually found in one study with adolescents, they had the adolescents journal for 20 minutes a day on the positive things that happened that day. That's all they were supposed to journal about. And they actually found reductions in their feelings of hopelessness, helplessness, and feelings of depression and anxiety over the course of a three-month period. At its core, cognitive behavioral therapy has the principles of noticing, understanding, and addressing thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Our feelings are not wrong. Our thoughts are not wrong. They may not be 100% accurate for the current situation, but what we're thinking, what we're feeling is based on information that we have in our memory banks that helped us anticipate this current situation. We want to recognize our feelings of anxiety, anger, depression, happiness, whatever it is, as normative responses to what we understand in the moment to be going on. Our body wants to protect us. If we feel that there's a threat for some reason, you know, you get that spidey sense going off in the pit of your stomach, or you start having these thoughts that tell you that you are trapped or you're in danger for some reason, then the natural reaction is to have you know, but do things that are going to protect ourselves. When we have those thoughts, the natural reaction is for us to have fight or flight feelings. That's our body saying, hey, I want to survive. So let's get the heck out of here. <clears throat> the triad activity that we want to have people start out with is recognizing the connection between thoughts feelings, and behaviors. So for example, if you're going out on a first date or going in for a job interview, you can start anywhere in that triad and anywhere that you make an alteration, you're probably going to affect the other three areas. So I usually draw the triad on the whiteboard and I start, use this as the beginning of my cognitive behavioral group, but we say, okay, you are going out on a job interview and you feel nervous. So that is your feeling. What are your thoughts during this thing? And the thoughts may be, I may not do well. I may trip over my own tongue. I, you know, there's a lot of thoughts going on. So we can help people recognize that a lot of times their feelings are based on the thoughts that they're having. And then we say, okay, if you're anxious, you're nervous, you're getting ready to go in for this job interview or go out on this date, when you're feeling anxious and you're having those 
threat-related thoughts, how does that affect your behavior? What do you do differently? And then we say, okay, let's just hypothesize. Let's imagine or think about somebody who goes out on dates or goes on job interviews and is 100% confident. You know, we all know somebody like that who just seems like they have the world by the tail. They go into this act activity and they feel confident. What types of things are they telling themselves and how is their behavior affected by the way they feel and the way they think? And then compare and contrast the nervous person from the confident person in their behaviors, thoughts, and, and feelings. What I want people to see is the benefits. For example, if you are nervous about getting ready to go into this job interview or go out on this first date and you decide to, you choose the behavior of either drinking a lot of coffee or drinking alcohol, uh, how does that affect your behavior? How does that affect your thoughts and your feelings? And, you know, is it a positive thing or a negative thing? You can do the same activity with flying. A lot of people are afraid of flying. Um, and then there's a lot of people who aren't. So you can compare and contrast. Or current events. If there are events that are stressing people out, like coronavirus right now, we can look at how our thoughts, our feelings, and our behaviors are impacting how we feel. Um, I was working with a client this morning who reported that, you know, her mood has been getting progressively low and we talked about what she's been doing. And one of the things she hasn't been doing is getting outside. She's been holed up in her apartment for, you know, days and days and days on end. So she's not getting vitamin D. She's not setting her circadian rhythms. She started noticing that she was sleeping a lot more. So those behaviors are in turn affecting her mood because it's altering her neurotransmitter levels, which is in turn altering her thoughts some because she feels trapped and she feels lethargic and she feels frustrated. We do want people to see how their behaviors, in addition to their thoughts, can impact their feelings. We also want people to notice that in certain situations like flying, we'll go back here for example, that sometimes we use what's called emotional reasoning. We feel scared. Therefore, we look for reasons to support our feeling of anxiety. Uh, when I travel, you know, I don't travel very often. I don't travel very well most of the time. And so I go into it with anxiety. It's not that I'm afraid to fly. It's, um, you know, more the other stuff going into it, doing something that I'm not familiar with doing that stresses me out. But I'm anxious and I have to look at the situation and I, and say, you know, am I anxious because there's actually a threat? Is there really anything supporting, in fact, supporting my fear or am I trying to find reasons to justify my anxiety? Am I using emotional reasoning? That is a huge concept to help clients embrace recognizing the difference between factual and emotional based reasoning because you know a lot of times if we feel anxious we can find reasons you know if i look hard enough i can find a reason to be angry if i look hard enough i can find a reason to be anxious if i look hard enough i can also find a reason to be confident content or happy one of the things that we can have clients practice doing is what I call a functional analysis timeline or backwards chaining and forwards chaining, whatever you want to call it. It's the process of identifying antecedents and consequences of behavior. You want to take the behavior, whatever it was, um, maybe the person got depressed and decided to drink a fifth of whiskey. Okay. So that is the behavior that they did. So we want to look at the antecedents. What led up to that emotionally, mentally, physically, interpersonally, and environmentally? What was going on? What triggered it? And yes, I say environmentally because if somebody is in an environment where they don't have access to alcohol, then they are clearly not going to be able to drink a fifth of alcohol unless they, you know, get up, get dressed, leave the house, those sorts of things. So it is important to include the environment as well as the time and date. And why is that important? 
because it helps people recognize if there are certain time and date triggers for them, maybe anniversaries uh, in terms of date, holidays in terms of date, or just times of day. Some people start to feel much more depressed or much more anxious in the evening when they don't have as much to do, when they're alone with their own thoughts. If people recognize that a danger time for them is in the evening after dinner, but before they go to bed, or if they wake up in the middle of the night and they're not able to get back to sleep, whatever the danger time is for them, it's really important for them to understand. And then we look at the behavior, whatever they did. And then we want to look at the consequences of the behavior, the emotional, mental, physical, social, and potentially environmental consequences of what they did. And, you know, when they sober up the next morning, how do they feel emotionally? You know, how do they feel mentally? How do they feel about themselves? What's their self-esteem like? How do they feel physically? Probably not so good. And encourage them to evaluate whether that was the best choice for them in order to deal with their distress. I like, I personally, I'm very visual, so it's me. It's not necessarily everybody's cup of tea, but I really like to draw these things on either a chalkboard or a whiteboard in order to help people visualize how one thing led to another, led to another, led to another. You also don't want to stop with singular things like, um, emotionally I was sad, so I drank. You want to be able to back up maybe to the beginning of the day or the beginning of the week and start seeing where this behavior started, uh, where this trend toward this behavior started. Uh, for example, if I get up in the morning and I get up on the total wrong side of the bed and I am cranky, I didn't sleep well, okay. Well, I've got several things right there. Now, that doesn't mean I'm necessarily going to have a bad day. However, you know, I wake up late. That doesn't help. I run late for work. I get to work late. Um, maybe I, I get caught at every traffic light on the way. I get there and my boss calls me into his office and, you know, reads me the riot act for being late. You know. All of those things, any of those one things or any of those individual things, maybe I could have handled without a whole lot of distress. But all of those things additively just kind of pushed me up and over the edge, so to speak, in terms of stress. So it's important to look at, you know, not just the most proximal incidents, but going back at least to the beginning of the day. And looking at what was going on emotionally, mentally, physically, interpersonally, and environmentally that may have made this person more vulnerable or contributed to the undesired behavior. And you can do a lot of scenarios with this. You know, you can have people talk about losing their temper. You can have people talk about, um, you know, you, you guys know that I, I work primarily with co-occurring disorders, so you can talk about that. You can talk about, um, for some people with clinical depression, just going back to bed, not being able to leave the house. We want to look at what got to that point or maybe leaving work early because they were just so overwhelmed. Have people identify symptoms or behaviors that are currently problematic for them, put them on the board one at a time. And then do backward and forward chaining to see what triggered it, what preempted it, and or what, what caused it, and what the consequences were. So then they can decide, all right, you know, I can see how that's not helpful. And you can put an alternate behavior and then do a functional analysis timeline. Like where along the way, you know, you had all these things going wrong throughout the day. You got up. And it was just bam, bam, bam. You just kept getting um, hit with things that were unpleasant. What could you have done along the way to intervene, to stop that progression of feeling out of control, of feeling powerless? And maybe call a friend, maybe vent, maybe whatever it is. You know, people have different ways of dealing with distress. Um, 
But likely, if that person would have taken steps earlier along in that behavior chain, they may have prevented the ultimate um, unpleasant behavior or unwanted behavior of drinking a fifth of alcohol. Another activity that people can do is called unhooking and diffusion. We talk about separating pe ourselves from our thoughts and fears, and this comes straight out of acceptance and commitment therapy. You can read more about it um, if you read on some of the acceptance and commitment therapy journals or any of the ACT videos on the All CEUs website on YouTube. But the basic thing with this activity is fears, fusion, excessive goals, avoidance of discomfort, and remoteness from value. So what does that mean? Well, I put all four of these things, fears, on the whiteboard, and we start out by talking with fusion. When I say I am depressed, well, that means it's part of me. I am something. I am a female. I am a person. If I quit being a person, what happens? If I quit being a female, you know, what, what happens if I quit being? So unhooking from our thoughts, instead of saying, I am terrified, saying, I'm having the thought that I'm terrified. And y'all know I've talked before about how my thoughts can be here one minute and be gone before I can even get to the kitchen. And I don't remember why I went there. Thoughts are different. And it sounds like it wouldn't work. But it does. And one of the activities uh, Hayes encourages you to try is to tell yourself, and I usually modify this one because I don't like having patients actually go through this, telling themselves, I am worthless, I am ugly, I am useless, I am, you know, repeat that to themselves as much as they can and try to make themselves believe it for five minutes. And then change and tell themselves, I am having the thought that I am stupid. I am the, having the thought that I am useless. And notice the difference between when, you, when I say I am this versus I'm having the thought that I am. And it really does make a difference. I usually choose something a little bit more benign than um, something quite as deprecating as that. A lot of times we talk about the thoughts that we have when we see a commercial on TV at night. This is one of my big weaknesses. Uh, if I see a commercial for uh, on TV at night for pizza, I love myself some pizza. Um, and I start thinking, I have to have pizza. I need, oh, I need to have a piece of pizza right now. That is hooking onto that thought that's saying, I have to do this. I must, I am. If I unhook from that thought and I'm saying, and I tell myself, I'm having the thought that I need to have pizza right now. All right. Well, that also takes a lot longer to say, but I actually don't feel as attached to it because I know that thoughts will come and go. I've experienced that throughout my entire life. So however you want to demonstrate fusion to people, it's important to help them learn how to diffuse or unhook from those thoughts so they recognize that they're just thoughts. It is not something we have to act on. I can have a lot of thoughts. Um, when right after I had my son, I had wicked postpartum depression and a lot of very intrusive thoughts that were terrifying to me. Um, and if you're not familiar with postpartum depression, uh, one of the key differences between postpartum depression and postpartum psychosis is the... Um, in, in postpartum depression, those thoughts are very egodystonic, which means we recognize that they are not real, they are unhealthy, and they terrify us. In postpartum psychosis, the thoughts that you may be having, if they seem logical, if they seem like they make sense, then, you know, that is a huge red flag warning sign. But I digress. Uh, this is one of those activities that can be really helpful with people with uh, families struggling from postpartum depression, and men get it too. Men have been shown to also develop postpartum depression. Um, I know that this isn't a class on PPD, but one of my little soapboxes, you'll just have to bear with me. 
So once we notice the difference between fusion and diffusion or hooking and unhooking from our thoughts, we unhook from our thoughts, just like unhooking a railroad car. So we watch the train go on past, you know, we got off on that last stop. That's okay. Then we go down to excessive goals. Sometimes we have goals that are too big or too hard, or we don't have the skills to accomplish what we want. And that can keep us from feeling safe. Um, avoidance of discomfort or unwillingness to make room for this, the, the discomfort. And we'll go back to pizza for this one because y'all know I like pizza. Um, when I have that thought that, oh, I, I need to have that pizza, um, then I unhook and I say, I'm having the thought that I need to have pizza. If I am willing to tolerate the discomfort, if I don't avoid the discomfort that comes with urge surfing, noticing that urge come in and go out, I have to be able to, or be willing to make room for that discomfort until that urge, you know, goes away, which takes anywhere from five to 20 minutes, depending on the strength of the urge and how much attention you pay to it. But if I'm willing to tolerate that discomfort, which is where your distress tolerance activities come in, then, you know, that's another step toward dealing with an anxious things. And then R stands for, for remoteness from values, evaluating what it is that we want with that thought that we're having. You know, I'm, I want that pizza. Um, I'm having the thought that I want that pizza. Now, is having that piece of pizza, how does that fit in with my values? How does that fit in with my goals in, in life right now? And, you know, having a great big pizza pe piece of pizza at 10 o'clock at night doesn't fit in with my goals really well. It's going to impair my sleep. It is, I'm probably going to feel guilty for eating, you know, that many calories that late at night. Um, you know, there's a lot of reasons why, you know, that's really not a choice that helps work with my goals. Fears is a great thing to help people understand when they are feeling anxious, when they are feeling frustrated, when they are feeling urges, it's important for them to be able to unhook or diffuse. It's important for them to be willing to tolerate that discomfort instead of avoid it. And it's important for them to be able to look at their choices and say, okay, I am having this thought right now. Now I have options. I can either do something else or I can follow through with this thought. Which one is more in line with my goals and values, the things that create my rich and meaningful life? Is it more important for me to fulfill this immediate urge or for me to do something different. The antidote to fear is dare. So diffusion, we talked about that a little bit. I am having feelings of, you know, if somebody is feeling anxious, I am having feelings of anxiety. Instead of saying, I am anxious, saying I am having feelings of anxiety. Uh, instead of saying, I think that, or I can say, I'm having the thought that something's going on. Or if I'm, another thing for behaviors, instead of being hooked to my behaviors, you know, I have to go to the gym. I'm having the thought that I have to go to the gym. A stands for acceptance of discomfort, like I talked about earlier. R stands for set realistic goals and fact-based thoughts. If I'm having the thought that I have to have that, I'm having the thought that I have to have that piece of pizza right now, where are the facts for that? Am I completely malnourished? Am I going to die if I don't have that piece of pizza right now? No, there is no fact supporting the notion that I have to have that right now. Um, but setting realistic goals, you know, is it realistic to say I can never have it ever again? No. One thing I might set in my mind to help me deal with the moment is to say, okay, I am having the thought that I want that piece of pizza. Y'all are going to be so hungry by the end of this class. <laughs> I'm having that thought 
And a realistic goal is I can have that for lunch tomorrow. You know, so I'm not saying I can't ever have it again, but I am saying here's a goal, you know, and embracing values, going along with what is the best choice in response to this feeling or thought that I'm having right now in order to help me get closer to my ultimate goal of health and happiness and a rich and meaningful life. The more we live authentically, the more we choose behaviors that help us be the person that we know we are, that we want to be, the more we feel empowered and efficacious. If we're able to delay that gratification, we feel empowered. We feel like we've got more control over our lives. Um, living authentically increases happy feelings and positive thoughts and behaviors. There are a lot of ways we can use this. I, I have on here examples. I've used this technique with people with addictions, people with abandonment anxiety, people with cancer. One of the things that you can do as a group activity is break your group into smaller groups of two to four people and give them a problem, addiction, abandonment, uh, cancer, whatever the issue is. Uh, give them a problem that they need to apply dare to. So the first thing that they have to identify is what are the feelings or thoughts that they are having? What are the behaviors that they feel they must be doing? How can they accept the discomfort? What are realistic goals and fact-based thoughts in this situation? And what are they able to do in order to help them embrace values. And they have to be, um, they have, have to suppose that they are a particular person because you've got to figure out what the values are. But in general, uh, your group members probably have the same goal of health and happiness. So what are they doing in dealing with this urge, in dealing with these thoughts that are helping them move towards help and happiness? health and happiness. I like doing small group activities like this where you break them into little mini groups because when people talk about something, when they figure out how to teach something, they are manipulating it like six ways to Sunday in their mind, which strengthens those memory pathways. It also helps them identify if they're unclear on the actual application of the technique. Problem identification and problem solving, cited E. Um, sometimes I have difficulty with my, with my mnemonic devices. The first is stop. Use self-talk, distress tolerance, and or relaxation techniques to help yourself restrain impulsive actions. Um, there are, I use music a lot in my uh, counseling techniques because a lot of songs. They're catchy. So if a person finds a song that fits with their goal for that day, they can sing it to themselves, remind themselves. This one, I believe it was Martha and the Vandellas, stop in the name of love before you break my heart. Think it over. Think it oh over. Um, I love that refrain because that's exactly what I want people to do before they react. Um, then there's Bobby McFerrin's Don't Worry, Be Happy. Um, uh, Jimmy Eats World, The Middle, or just the plain old serenity prayer. Whatever people can use to help them stop and take a pause, practice the pause. Once they stop, that is their willingness, that is their taking that time to notice, to become mindful so they can identify the problem, the who, what, where's, when's, and why's of what's going on. D stands for develop alternate alternative solutions. Nothing's off the board because we're not acting on anything. We're just putting all of our options out there. So what would you like to do? Maybe you'd like to go back to bed. Maybe you'd like to punch a wall. Maybe you'd like to, okay, those, we can put those out there. Those are definitely options. Are they the best option? Probably not, but they're options. What are other options that might help you get towards closer to, to your goal of health and happiness, letting it go, practicing assertiveness, you know, depending on the problem, there are going to be different solutions. 
But having a person develop a menu of alternative solutions that they can choose from is really important. And I love doing this in a large group because people have the ability to brainstorm. And a lot of times people come up with suggestions that other people in the room hadn't thought of. And they're like, oh, that's a great idea. So this is a fun individual um, or a fun activity to do with the whole group. E stands for explore the short and long-term consequences or outcomes of each of the solutions. So you go to, you know, putting my fist through the wall because I'm angry. All right. What are the short and long-term benefits of that? You know, once you evaluate it, you realize it's probably not the best choice. Um, this helps them start practicing weighing the pros and the cons of this thing, getting into the into their wise mind, as Linehan would say. While they're doing this, they are also a, allowing their body to calm down a little bit. They're allowing the adrenaline to kind of bleed off, which is helping open up that view from tunnel vision to seeing more in a 270 degree radius. Decide on a response and then evaluate the outcome. So maybe you decide that I'm angry and so the best course of action is for me to go on a walk. And you get up and you go out and you go on a walk. Well, that's great. You decided on the response, you took action. Then when you come back, it's important to evaluate the outcome. If you're still angry, well, that's probably not the best solution. It is important to evaluate the outcome in order to figure out what works for you. And what works for one person in the group is not going to work for everybody. Um, I like using mnemonic devices because they're easy for clients to remember and in order to implement solutions. Ask people. When you experience a problem, how can you remember to practice the pause? And a lot of times I just do this in group. I'll call on every single person in the group to give me an answer. What techniques can you use to get through the initial adrenaline rush? Distress tolerance techniques are really what we're talking about here. And I, I like doing the alphabet just, you know, to shake things up a little bit. So we go through and identify a distress tolerance technique for each letter of the alphabet. Once you've done this once or twice with group, um, usually it goes a whole lot faster. But I like doing it more than once over the course of a treatment period, 90 days or whatever, because I want this to be rote for them. I want this to be second nature to think distress tolerance. What can I do? And have a menu of things kind of at their fingertips without having to really think about it. Describe a time you got upset and effectively managed it. You can go around the group and have people do this. Um, another thing that I've done is I'll take balloons. And yes, these are adults. And it is actually fun. And we keep the balloons in the air. And if somebody hits the balloon and somebody else goes for it and misses it and it hits the ground, whoever missed the balloon has got to describe a time they got upset and effectively managed it. So it gives us a little break between balloon tossing so we don't work up too much of a sweat, but it also gets some feel-good chemicals going on. Uh, give a time, give an example of a time you got upset and didn't effectively manage it. That's also a good thing to talk about because it starts identifying prior times when these new skills could have been used. I have people practice identifying the problem. Who is involved? Thinking broadly, not just me and this other person. You know, was anybody else involved? Did anybody else contribute to it? What happened objectively? And sometimes that means going from not only my perspective, but also the other, trying to put myself in the other person's shoes and describe it from their perspective. And then maybe from a third um, objective person's objective. You know, if somebody was walking by and they saw this going on, what would they have seen happening? When did this take place in the chain of life events that happened, 
you know, with this interaction with this person? Where did it take place? And is there a significance to this place? If it took place um, somewhere that is particularly emotionally charged for someone, it may help them recognize that they are more vulnerable to distress in that particular situation. And why did this happen and why did it bother you? I love using these as journal prompts for people to do at the end of the day, identifying one problem they had that day and describing all of these things so they can think more in depth about what's going on. The next step, we're not done yet, is identify alternatives. Alternatives to your immediate response. You know, if your immediate response was to lash out in anger, okay, um, that, what, are, what were the benefits to that and what were the drawbacks to that? What are alternatives? Instead of lashing out in anger, what could you have done? And what would have the benefits and drawbacks been to that? So this usually is a one-sheeter for, uh, for journaling, but I find that even doing it with one, ac- one problem one time a day really helps people start becoming a lot more cognizant of their triggers and also of alternate solutions because they're looking at it going, oh yeah, that probably would have been a better choice. And, you know, the next time this happens, I will probably try to do this, do it differently. Flip chart stations, I am a fan of. Uh, You can do it a variety of ways. If you can get in um, the small dry erase boards, Obviously, that's going to be more eco-friendly. I just compost all of our flip charts. But if you put flip chart stations around the room and you have on each, in each station, you identify a problem, a problem behavior, a problem, an issue that is common for the clients in your group. At each station, you have them talk amongst themselves and identify on the, on the whiteboard the function and benefit of the behavior, a new alternate, more helpful behavior to replace it, rewards for the new behavior and drawbacks to the old behavior. So for example, um, maybe my problem or target behavior is not working out and, and watch it. Maybe I'm watching too much TV and the function or benefit of the behavior. Well, I'm exhausted at the end of the day. It's relaxing. What else could I do besides binge watching Netflix that could help me relax? What are rewards for this new behavior? Like for me, it's gardening. What are rewards for me going out gardening versus binge watching Netflix? What are drawbacks to the old behavior? Identify and address drawbacks to the new behavior. You know, why, what might keep me from wanting to go out and, you know, play in the garden? Um, Write a contract, even if it's with your own self, write a contract with yourself and put it on the refrigerator or your bathroom mirror that says that, you know, after a hard day to help myself relax, I will blah, blah. And then monitor your behavior. What I have people do is go around to each station and practice using this technique you know, four or five times. So they're, you know, rotating through the stations. And if you have the luxury of the dry erase boards at each station, then they leave the problem, but then they erase all of their answers. And the next group that comes through starts anew. Now, we talked about flip charts. You can also use beach balls. You can get those really inexpensive beach balls at, you know, the dollar store or wherever. You blow them up and then you just randomly write on them with permanent marker. Um, and for this activity, I write target behaviors, things that people want to change, such as persistent worrying, not getting out of bed, anger outbursts, smoking, stress eating, um, or caving or being overly passive. You know, those are six common issues that my clients deal with. And I write, I have those written on a beach ball and we toss around the beach ball. And when somebody gets, catches the beach ball, they look down, whatever problem is facing them, whatever problem they read, they have to 
identify the vulnerabilities for each, identify the benefits and drawbacks, identify alternative ways of meeting the same need, and identify ways to address the target behavior. So let's apply that. Persistent worrying. All right, so I get this. What are my vulnerabilities for persistent worrying? I know that I tend to worry more when I haven't gotten a good, a good night's sleep, when I feel disconnected, um, when, you know, I don't have, when I don't, when I feel disconnected from other people. Um, benefits and drawbacks of worrying. Well, the benefit, if I worry, then it keeps me from being caught unaware. So, you know, in a way it m might feel a little bit protective. Um, drawback, it uses a lot of energy. It, you know, distracts me throughout the day. Alternative, alternative ways of meeting the same need of keeping myself safe. Instead of worrying, what could I do? And, you know, a lot of times that goes to looking at the problem, identifying what parts I have control over and doing that. My daughter uh, just recently started driving. Oh my gosh. Um, so there was a lot of worry there. Identifying vulnerabilities for each. You know, I knew that if it was a rainy day I, and she was driving, I was going to be a little more worried. Or if she's driving in, in uh, heavy traffic, those things are going to contribute to me being more anxious. I know these things. And so initially, I, we... My husband and I both asked her not to drive in the rain and, you know, not during rush hour. The benefits of worrying, well, I don't want her to be unsafe. Uh, drawbacks to worrying, well, you know, like any teenager, she felt a little trapped. She felt frustrated. And sometimes she felt like we didn't trust her, um, even though we explained to her that it was other drivers we didn't trust. Identify alternate ways of meeting the same need to keeping her safe so I could feel calm. Um, having her not drive when it was raining, having her text me whenever she got, especially when she first started driving, text me whenever she got to her location so I know, knew she got there fine. Um, there were a lot of different things I was able to do so I wouldn't just sit there and be a balled up mess. Um, and ways to address the target behavior. When I did start worrying, I would remind myself that she was safe. She was following the rules. She would text me, you know, and I would look at my phone and, you know, if it was 20 minutes past when she should have texted me, then I would text her. But, you know, that there were things that I could do. And it's important for people to recognize what they are in control of and what alternate possible behaviors are, are there as well. Um, you can also break people in or break your groups. Don't break people, please, into the smaller micro groups and have them each work on a different target behavior and go through these questions. Schedule in the positive. And we do this on Fridays in our Friday groups. Uh, so I call it Friday Roundup. But I want people to make sure that they have scheduled in the positive for, especially for the weekend. What are you going to do to help you relax, to have fun, to help you rest, to help you socialize? Tell me what that's going to look like. I want more than just eliminating unhappiness. I want adding enthusiasm. And we talk about that in terms of the weekend, but also we look retrospectively and I say, what did you do last week? to schedule in the positive. I ask all of my clients to schedule in the positive at least twice a day, 10 minutes, at least twice a day of scheduling in the positive. If they want to do longer or more often, cool. That is super awesome. But at least 10 minutes of positive twice a day. I want to know what they did. And it's important for them, for them, in my opinion, in early recovery, in early treatment to be held accountable not only for addressing the problems, but also for recognizing that they deserve to be happy and adding in that positive. Chunking and successive approximations. You can do this in flip chart stations. There are a variety of ways you can do it. Um, but chunking involves breaking overwhelming tasks into smaller ones, such as recovery. 
whether you're dealing with anxiety, depression, addiction, eating disorders, whatever, recovery can seem totally overwhelming. So let's chunk it. Let's talk about what you need to do today. That's chunk number one. What do you need to do this week? Chunk number two, you know, break it into small manageable chunks, nothing over a month, because I want people to be able to accomplish those. In the first 90 days of recovery, my preference is to do daily chunks. What do you need to do today? And, you know, we may say, okay, I want you to stay uh, clean and sober all week. Well, that's great. That's a goal. But let's chunk that because that's a big undertaking for a lot of people in early recovery. What do you need to do today? What do you need to do tomorrow? Have them break it into small steps. Just like if you were mountain climbing, you're not going to scale a mountain in 300 foot steps. There are individual steps and you've got to plant your little pokey things. I'm not a mountain climber. You've got to plant your little pokey things. <laughs> each step of the way in order to make sure that you're anchored. And that's where chunking comes in. Every time you accomplish a chunk, you've made one little step forward. Same thing with successive approximations. It's basically the same principle. Uh, running a marathon or doing laundry, <laughs> um, stopping smoking, addressing fears. There are a lot of small steps you can take along the way. If I think, all right, I'm going to go out and run 24.3 miles, that's overwhelming. If I think, okay, today I'm going to go out and run a mile. Tomorrow, I'll run a mile and a quarter. That Those are small chunks or successive approximations that help me get closer and closer to my goal. Be and become activity. This is another beach ball one. Um, recognizing how cognitive distortions get um, integrated into our life and impact us. Remember, thoughts impact our feelings and our behaviors. If somebody takes things personally, they think everything was their fault or they think whatever the person did, whatever happened was directed towards them. Encourage people to think of three alternate explanations for why it could have happened besides them. Exaggeration, making a mountain out of a molehill or seeing the worst case scenario. So exaggeration or catastrophizing. Encourage them to look at the facts of the situation and look at the probability that that worst case scenario is going to come true. All or nothing thinking, viewing things in dichotomous terms, always encourage people to look for the exceptions. The availability heuristic w means noticing what's most prominent in your mind, generally what most recently happened or what was most powerful, like knowing that a plane crashed somewhere. All right, well, that's going to stick with you. The fact that 20 million planes flew every day or 20,000 or wh however many it is, that doesn't even register because that's not nearly as available. Um, and I like doing this on a beach ball. I put the um, cognitive distortions on the beach ball, just like the other activities. They look down, identify the distortion that they see, give an example of how they have used that cognitive distortion, and give an example of um, alternate ways to deal with it. Like, for example, personalization. I could identify three other explanations besides why it had anything to do with me. I want them to have these tools to deal with distortions and awareness of distortions. I want that to be second nature for them. Minimization, not giving credit where credit is due. For example, when you do good things, a lot of times you won't take credit for them. Or when other factors are involved. It's important for people to recognize when they're especially minimizing the positive and correct that by identifying the facts in the situation. And selective abstraction means seeing only what fits your mood or perspective. Um, helping people recognize the big picture. You know, if you are having a bad day, you typically notice the negative things or you see things through a negative lens. Um, and encouraging people to take off those 
mud colored glasses and recognize that, yeah, there may be some sucky things going on right now, but there's also some good things. So rec- not being selective in what we notice, but noticing the good and the bad. So as, as I said, suggested earlier, giving an example of when you've used each distortion, you can do this with a beach ball or like, um, uh, somebody else here, Cheryl had also mentioned using Jenga. You can have Jenga blocks painted in multiple different colors and each color can represent a cognitive, a different type of cognitive distortion. Discuss why each distortion may develop. You know, why did you develop this? need or this thought that everything was about you. Explore the positives, the benefits and drawbacks of each distortion and identify ways to address each distortion. And we just talked about those. A, B, C, D, E is kind of back to uh, cognitive behavioral therapy 101, recognizing activating events and consequences, what happens, how you feel, are often fueled by automatic or really rapid beliefs that are often based on prior schema. So the D stands for disputing those automatic beliefs. And E stands for evaluating the effectiveness of your reactions. Sometimes you go through and you dispute the beliefs and there's still a lot of them there. And you say, okay, well, maybe this was an upsetting situation. Was my reaction to this situation the best reaction? So when I got upset, was putting my fist through the wall the most effective reaction to this situation? Have people identify three things that trigger anxiety for them. Bridges, that's me, authority figures, tests, relatives coming to visit, whatever it is. And identify three more things that trigger anger, like tailgating, lying, computer problems, and laziness. Um, I know Rebecca can, you know, um, feel the whole computer problem thing, and I I feel bad for you today. Um, And then have them apply the A, B, C, D, E's to those situations. And you can do this in, um, with the flip charts. You can have people go around and on each, um, uh, flip chart or each dry erase board, there is a different trigger for anxiety or anger and have people apply the, um, identify potential automatic beliefs, dispute them, and then evaluate the effectiveness of their reactions. Cognitive restructuring or embracing the middle path literally means changing your thoughts. Encourage people to find meaning in the current event. Challenge the interpretation or develop a both and perspective. This is so true right now. You know, a lot of people have been talking about, you know, all of the downsides and the struggles with quarantine and and shutdowns and everything. And that is totally true. I, I agree. However, there have also been some positive things that have come out of it. So finding meaning in the current event for yourself. Um, and that can be challenging. You know, there are, I know there are a lot of people that are really struggling right now. Um, so there may not be a lot to find here, but it is important to try to look and see if there are, if there are any good parts coming out of it for you. Maybe you're learning something about yourself. Uh, Sometimes this is a little bit too Pollyanna-ish for people, especially when they are like really depressed. Um, But it isn't a technique that can be helpful sometimes. Examples of restructuring. Encouraging people to look at situations like going to an interview or public speaking where you, one person could see it as a threat Or they could change their thoughts, restructure, and instead see it as a challenge. And I like challenges. If a relationship fails, they could either see it as a failure and a reflection on them, or they could see it as a learning experience. So you see where where I'm going with that. Again, with the three common triggers for anxiety or anger, having people find meaning in the current event helping them figure out ways to interpret the event as a challenge instead of a threat and develop a both and perspective. 
In systematic desensitization, people learn to effectively use coping skills to reduce distress through gradual exposure. Level one is having the person imagine and describe the distressing event. Once they do that, they're going to activate that HPA axis. It's going to be important for them to rate their distress on a scale from one to five and then use their skills of choice, whatever that helps them, to reduce their stress until they're back down at a one. So they can think about it, they can describe it, they can talk about it without getting wound up. Level two is exposing yourself at a safe distance to the distressing event. And again, working through until you can do that and not have that stress reaction. So you go, you practice De, um, practice re-regulating yourself until you get to the point that you can expose yourself at a safe distance without having to use those tools because you just don't rev up the same way. And then level three is experiencing this distressing event. You know, we've talked about this in Psychology 101 when, with people who have phobias of spiders, but it can be used for a lot of things, including taking a uh, college entrance exam or moving to a new place or th there are a lot, even just having an assertive conversation with someone. In cognitive processing therapy, we have people use analytical questions to help identify cognitive errors and make more effective choices. It helps them address their overgeneralization and emotional reasoning. So we ask, what is the evidence for and against my thought that this is a problem. You know, if I get upset and I feel um, I'm having the thought that uh, I am angry, you know, what is the threat and what is the evidence for and against that threat that is making me feel angry? Is this based on facts or feelings? You know, are there actual facts to support my notion that there's a threat? Am I considering all aspects of the situation? Am I using all or nothing terms? Am I confusing high and low probability events? You know, if I get on an airplane, is it a high or a low probability event that the airplane's going to crash? Could it crash? Yes. But it is a pretty low possibility. And what is the most logical course of action? This is also really helpful right now for helping people start resuming their lives once we start reopening, there's going to be a lot of need to ask ourselves these questions as we start exposing ourselves to other people again. Um, you know, am I using all or nothing terms? Am I confusing high and low probability events? The dysphoria deck, I don't know what else to call it. It's a card deck I have made of index cards um, that have on them different things that trigger anger, anxiety, and depression for my clients. And, you know, I've created them over the period of some years and I have them go through, they draw a card off the deck and they answer those cognitive processing therapy questions. And I have everybody create an emergency card that they keep in their wallet or they put on a note notepad document on their mobile device that has these questions on it. So when they start feeling upset, they can look at those questions and they can answer them. Merely the process of going through the questions gives the body time to re-regulate a little bit and help the person get into their wise mind. Accepting reality as it is and committing to choosing thoughts and behaviors which will help them move towards a rich and meaningful life is the underpinning of psychological flexibility. It's important that people feel committed to improving the next moment and realize that there are multiple aspects of life to commit to in a rich and meaningful life. You know, my relationship with my significant other might be going bad one day, but there are other things in my life to which I'm committed that are also going well. So it's important for me to recognize that I am committed to multiple things and I don't want to throw everything away just because one thing is going bad. Have people define a rich and meaningful life by identifying their top five characteristics they want to be known for. And you can Google a values worksheet if we have... A, 
I'll pull it up for those of you who stick around later. Um, I know I'm running out of time right now. Have people identify the most important people in their life and which people are unimportant in their life, but they are allowing those people to have their energy anyway. You know, sometimes there are people that you don't even know on Facebook that you get upset about every post that they post. You know, is this person important in your life or are you giving this unimportant person energy? And what things, hobbies, and activities are important in your life? The whole goal is to identify where we want to spend our energy. Recognizing that when something happens, we have a myriad of choices for thoughts, behaviors, and feelings. And we are able to notice in the moment how we're feeling and then decide which course of action is going to help us at that point in time. Ideally, we want to choose behaviors, thoughts, and feelings that are going to move us towards our goals of a rich and meaningful life. There are a variety of ways to help people explore and address the thoughts which may be keeping them stuck. Some techniques work better than others in certain situations. Since cognition is based on prior experiences, teaching cognitive behavioral therapy in group can help clients explore alternate interpretations and information in similar situations. So if two people have been through similar situations, they may have alternate interpretations and they can help broaden each other's understanding of what might be another interpretation. By developing a broader understanding of situations, people can explore the effectiveness of their thinking in terms of how it impacts their ability to live a rich and meaningful life. Are there any questions? I know I ran through the last part of that really fast uh, because we were running short on time, but my biggest goal today was to make sure that although you're probably familiar with a variety of cognitive behavioral tools, thinking about creative ways that you can implement them in group. Between writing notes, filing insurance claims, and scheduling with clients, it can be hard to stay organized. That's why I recommend Therapy Notes. Their easy-to-use platform lets you manage your practice securely and efficiently. Visit TherapyNotes.com to get two free months of Therapy Notes by just using the promo code CEU when you sign up for a free trial at TherapyNotes.com. If this podcast helps you help your clients or yourself, please support us by purchasing your CEUs at allceus.com or getting your agency to sponsor an episode. A direct link to the on-demand CEUs for this podcast is at allceus.com slash podcast CEUs. That's allceus.com slash podcast CEUs. To sponsor an episode of Counselor Toolbox and reach over 50,000 clinicians per week, go to allceus.com slash sponsor. Thank you.